have at Cornell a, a center that we call the Center for Innervating Neuroimmune Disease. This center spans our two campuses, the uh, campus in Ithaca, New York, and also the campus in Manhattan, New York. And we like the name enervating because it means causing you to feel weak and lacking in energy. And I think that's really a good uh, name for uh, MECFS. So in our uh, funded collaborative MECFS research center, we have three research projects, a clinical core and an integrative data analysis core. And uh, the uh, Two of the research projects are in this building uh, in the Department of Molecular Biology and Genetics. The clinical core is at Ithaca College, and uh, one of the projects is at uh, the uh, Imaging Center in New York City. The clinical core uh, will be dealing with the human subjects, and our clinical core co-directors are Betsy Keller uh, and Jeff Moore. Betsy Keller is well known to some of you as someone who has been using the two-day exercise test uh, for patients uh, over the last 10 years or so. We're going to have uh, three different sites where patients can participate, Ithaca, New York City, and also Los Angeles in uh, the clinic of John Chia. So the centerpiece of our uh, proposal was to study post-exertional malaise as a key symptom of the disease. As you know, uh, the Institute of Medicine made it at one of the uh, criteria for a diagnosis of MECFS. That in addition to the reduction in activity, post-exertional malaise, and unrefreshing sleep as the three key uh, required uh, symptoms, and of course, either cognitive impairment or orthostatic intolerance. So I think most people here know what post-exertional malaise is. I think this is a very nice definition from the IOM report because it's, it's an exacerbation that, uh, following exertion that would have been easily tolerated before, and that's an important feature of this, that before people became ill, they were able to easily tolerate exercise that they can no longer, any exertion that they can no longer tolerate. So, uh, in uh, several clinics, uh, the Workwell Foundation as well as Betsy Keller's clinic, uh, people have been objectively measured by two successive cardiopulmonary exercise tests. And the individuals she's testing have come to her because they need to document their disability for insurance companies, Social Security. And uh, because of uh, the um, degree of disability of the patients, a, a cycle rather than a treadmill is used uh, for, with both Workwell and uh, Ithaca College uh, Clinic. Uh, this measures the maximum heart rate, oxygen consumption, ventilatory threshold, maximum workload, and the respiratory exchange ratio. And this is very important, and it's why that people seek the test as an objective measure, because if you have a respiratory exchange ratio of greater than 1.1, that really indicates the participants are performing the work at maximum level, they're not deliberately sloughing off and pretending that they can't exercise. They, they, uh, uh, they are doing their maximum effort. So individuals who don't exercise regularly, who have heart failure, lung disease, multiple sclerosis, or end-stage renal disease, are known to reproduce their, their CPET, and I'm going to refer to these as CPETs now, cardiopulmonary exercise test, uh, within about 7%, uh, 24 hours later or later than that. But most CFS patients exhibit altered performance 24 hours after their first maximal CPET. And I'm just going to show one example of a patient who came in with a VO2 max of 25, anaerobic threshold of 16. Uh, this is, this is uh, you know, a sedentary person might have that level of uh, VO2 max. But when they came in for the second test, their VO2 max and their anaerobic threshold went down 25 and 27 percent. And that's something that hasn't been seen in other illnesses and is uh, really a hallmark objective uh, factor that you can use to diagnose uh, the disease. But also, uh, it also shows that somebody with this reduced VO2 max is really disabled. So in our first project, uh, we're going to be looking at neuroimaging 
uh, in relationship to an exercise challenge. And this is led by Tacoma Shungu at Wild Cornell Medicine, who is an uh, expert uh, and, uh, radiologist who has uh, been studying ME-CFS for some years. Uh, people will have MRI and PET scans uh, before uh, a, uh, an exercise challenge, and then we'll have another one 24 hours later. And we will also be collecting blood from these patients and be doing a number of tests on the blood that I'll describe later. His model is to study, uh, to use these two different types of neuroimaging, magnetic resonance spectroscopy and PET, uh, PET scans to, uh, in this case, to examine the brain metabolites as measures of oxidative stress and mitochondrial dysfunction. And he has a model that he proposed in 2012 that he's going to be further testing with these patients, but also now we'll be able to see what happens to patients after they have overexerted themselves and have induced post-exertional malaise. And then uh, he'll also be using a radio ligand to, to detect whether there's neuroinflammation in the brain again, before and after the exercise challenge. And so in Parkinson's disease, for example, you can see uh, an increase in the signal in parts of the brain that is indicative of neuroinflammation. The second project will be led by myself. Uh, it, again, it will be an analysis of blood before, taken before and after an exercise challenge on each of two days. And we have a number of uh, individuals who will be analyzing that blood in some way. We'll be doing mass spectrometry, looking at metabolites in plasma and vesicles. We'll be looking at the extracellular vesicles that are released, the size and the amount. We'll be doing proteomics on the vesicle protein cargo and also doing RNA sequencing on this vesicle protein cargo. And I have a collection of four co-investigators here who are experts in these respective uh, types of analysis. I just want to mention briefly, some of you may not be familiar with extracellular vesicles. This is something that is, there's so far no publications on extracellular vesicles in MECFS, although it's really a very active area of research in, for example, cancer. So cells release several types of extracellular vesicles, exosomes, these microvesicles, and apoptotic bodies. And especially in cancer, it's, it's being studied what, how these microvesicles released from one cell can influence another cell. So tumor cells send these out and they help prevent the uh, immune response that, uh, to detect the, uh, uh, can the fact that the cell is cancerous. And these vesicles have cargo such as cytokines and microRNAs and these can also uh, all alter uh, gene expression. Uh, this is just a pilot study that we did showing that you know, this is just one person before and after the first day, uh, and their vesicles increase right after exercise. Uh, they go back down, they increase after the second exercise, and we like to really find out what's in those vesicles. This has been known for some time that, uh, that after exercise, uh, extracellular vesicles are released. People are studying this in athletes and in healthy people with one, one idea being, well, maybe you can make someone better by actually treating them with exosomes from and uh, a healthy person uh, who is in good shape, uh, unlike, uh, unlike uh, people with illnesses. So we really want to find out how these vesicles may differ before and after exercise. The last project is being led by Andrew Grimson, who is a, an expert in microRNA and other types of RNA gene expression. Uh, the basis of this is the fact that there's a lot of symptoms that implicate immune activation and dysfunction in MECFS as is very well known to most of the people in this room. So we would like to know if there's a type of immune cell that has abnormal levels of expression of particular genes in MECFS patients. There are lots of different types of uh, immune cells and one of the problems is, is that most, in fact all the studies so far, have lumped all of these together. Uh, we study PBMCs, which is all the lymphocytes, or maybe all the T cells or all the B cells. We'd like to look at each individual type of immune cell and find out whether there's a particular type of cell that is dysregulated. So you, uh, in this system, you, I, you have individual cells. You get RNA from individual cells. You characterize that RNA through making cDNA and then doing DNA sequencing. And this is just, this is not our data, but an example from a paper in which each of these columns is 
the level of a single cell's RNA, and you can then you know, look at different cell types to see how do the different cell types differ from one another, and how do different uh, cell types uh, uh, change between MECFS patients and controls. We also have an integrative data analysis core. Uh, Fabian Campagna is an uh, expert bioinformaticist who runs a facility, actually, at, the, at Cornell Medical School. He will be taking a lot of this data and looking for correlations and uh, uh, actually doing a lot of the processing of the DNA sequencing, the initial processing of our RNA sequences. But he's also going to be our main person interacting with the DMCC, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of uh, information going back and forth there. So now I'd like to turn quickly to some work that uh, Solve MECFS has funded. These are pilot studies that were uh, it's very important for us to uh, investigate some uh, new aspects. Uh, uh, examining the cellular metabolism of immune cells uh, and metabolite profiling. Uh, this is the one that, that uh, Solve CFS has uh, been funding. I want to just mention this other one as well. The, uh, this study uh, is using this device called the Seahorse, which can measure separately glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondrion. I have a graduate student who is uh, working on this project, Alex Mandarano. Uh, uh, we use T cells isolated from 20 MECFS patients and 20 controls, the, the uh, subjects provided by Susan Levine. They uh, are about the same age and about the same BMI. and uh, what Alex found is that she could not detect any significant difference in glycolysis in the total T cells in these patients versus controls uh, here. That's the data right there. Uh, however, when she looked at the, the respiratory capacity, for unknown reasons, T cells from MECFS patients are using significantly less of their respiratory capacity than healthy individuals. And we don't yet know why this is, and, but it's an interesting difference between patients and controls. When I was out at the Stanford Community Symposium, I found out that uh, the Stanford group has similar data where the respiratory capacity is, is lower in patients. Now, we would like to know more about this. Again, is there a particular type of immune cell that differs? Uh, t there are subtypes of T cells, and we are looking at, again, all total T cells. We, uh, some T cells are involved in, in, in induction of immune responses or regulation of those and some of them destroy infected cells. We need more T cells, and, at this, very, and this past week, uh, Alex has been at Cimarron Research in Dan Peterson's clinic and has been isolating additional quantities of uh, PBMCs in order to make uh, uh, subtypes of T cells and uh, other types of immune cells to further this project. Now I'd like to turn to a project that was funded by Solve MECFS as well as NIH. And this was to look at plasma metabolites. We had, again, it's a pilot study. Don't have a ton of money for this. We had 19 samples of 19 healthy controls and 32 patients from our prior microbiome study. Uh, the age and the BMI being about the same. And these are the individuals involved in this uh, particular project. Uh, these samples, uh, as a result of the collaboration of Solve MECFS with, uh, with Metabolon, uh, they uh, were able to give us data on 832 metabolites in the plasma in these eight super pathways, all of these eight different pathways. And of course, I can't discuss all the data, but I'll just show you a few examples. Um, we had previously done, a, another, again, another pilot study on a very small sample size showing that these uh, metabolic pathways were disrupted. And we're finding in this new uh, study that similar, similar disruptions are detected. So for example, here are two fatty acids. Uh, here's the uh, mountain the healthy and the mountain MECFS. Uh, so we're seeing significant differences uh, in, in these uh, uh, samples. And again, this is taken at baseline. These people haven't exercised. This is just baseline. Uh, the plasma gl glucose was lower in both of the studies as well. Now, I'd like to turn to another pilot study that uh, Zahar mentioned earlier. Uh, we didn't have twins, uh, uh, pairs of twins, plural, but only a single pair of twins. And we had previously uh, just done a case report on this set of uh, identical twins in which one of them had, has ha had MECFS for three and a half years at the time their blood was collected. 
and analyzed. And all of the other parameters that we measured in these twins is uh, reported here. Uh, and this, this was actually funded by NIH and uh, Cornell, uh, th this case report. But we had not analyzed metabolites in these two twins, and we still had the blood samples. So with the uh, help of Salvemi CFS, we were able to do a metabolite analysis as a pilot to see what, what might be happening uh, uh, for exercise. And so we, uh, in the previous study, we had, uh, Betsy Keller had tested the well and the MECFS twin. And in the, the VO2 max of the, uh, uh, the MECFS twin was 7.5% less than the well twin. Uh, and, but after the, after the induction of post-existional malaise, the uh, ill twin was e you know, even lower. The VO2 max had gotten worse in the, in the ill twin. So the question that we had was how are plasma metabolites affected by exercise just in this one set of twins? And uh, uh, again, this, was, this data is from Metabolon. And because, of course, we don't have statistical analysis of this data because it's only you know, two people. But what was interesting is that 64, uh, 64 metabolites were twofold higher in the, in the patient. And the higher levels of short chain fatty acids, again, fatty acid disruption, as we, as we saw in our larger study. And it was also seen in Navio's large study. Uh, there were 51 that were twofold lower in the patient, including ones that we had found in the previous study, uh, larger studies uh, that were lower. But another thing that was very interesting was that after exercise, there were 138 uh, metabolites that went up in the control but down in the patient. And uh, uh, the, uh, there were also 108 that went down in the control but up in the patient. And again, uh, these are, are uh, uh, you know, potentially in, uh, interesting biomarkers for hypoxia, TCL dis TCA cycle dysfunction. So we think that by doing a much larger study, uh, in, in which will now be funded by the uh, NIH uh, Center grant, we'll be able to learn a lot about what happens to the metabolism before and after MECFS, uh, 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 before and after exercise in the MECFS patients versus the controls. And of course, on those very same people, we'll be getting all this data about extracellular vesicles, uh, RNA and uh, what happens to individual immune cells. So wh what are the, our ultimate goals? Our ultimate goals are to identify biomarkers. And there can be biomarkers for diagnosis. And that requires specificity for MECFS. But there's another type of biomarker that doesn't require any specificity. It'd be fine if these biomarkers, for example, exist in Parkinson's as well as MECFS. And that doesn't make them less useful if we can uh, use those to understand the disease and if we can see these biomarkers that may be in common with other diseases improve when we give a drug, it doesn't matter that they're not specific to MECFS. The, the other thing that we, of course, want is new understanding of the pathophysiology of the disease, the knowledge gap that Zahra mentioned. This could reveal the identity of existing drugs that can improve patients' conditions. And I think that when and I'm getting a lot of those emails, too, when is there going to be some new treatment I think the quickest treatment we're going to have is if we can find existing approved FDA, FDA approved drugs that may affect uh, MECFS patients. But of course, this will also indicate processes that are disrupted for which we need to develop new drugs. Just like when HIV was dis discovered, it was realized we need drugs that are active against retroviruses, and those drugs now have been developed and have greatly improved the lives of people with HIV. Thank you.